In honor of Veterans Day, WNCT is celebrating the service and sacrifice of our military heroes. We present to you Veterans Voices, honoring those who serve. Hello everyone, I'm Ken Watling and welcome to Jacksonville, home of Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. Not far from base is this spot, the Lejeune Memorial Gardens. It's become a centerpiece here in Jacksonville and over the years it's also become a place for remembrance and reflection. This place has become hallowed ground. It's a place to reflect. And it's a way to, for them to uh, remember the comrades that have passed away. And the Lejeune Memorial Gardens in Jacksonville started as a simple idea. This whole garden, it, it started growing uh, because of the memorials, because of the Beirut Memorial. That was our first memorial out here. This is all because of the, 20, the, the, the bomb blast in Beirut, Lebanon, back in 1983. Okay. It was a, uh, a Mercedes-Benz truck with 12,000 pounds of TNT ran right into the center of the building and, and blew everyone up. So you had 241 Marine sailors and soldiers that died. They were a peacekeeping force. It's a very uh, somber place. Even more so when your ties to it run deep. I know 18 guys on the wall. I'm still close to them, but they're families. They're called the boys because they never got anywhere else but the boys. They're, they're most of them are between the ages of 17 and 24 years old. 24 years old. We were all boys. We weren't weren't men, we're boys. And the gentleman points to the wall and he says, well, that's my son. What do you say when yeah. you have a parents and your son is on the wall? Now, if that's not heart-wrenching, I don't know what is. One of the newest memorials recognizes the Marines of Montford Point. It was a training ground for African-American Marines back in the 1940s. Each star on the wall represents one of the 20,000 men who were trained there. You can name them all, and I say that because unfortunately back then, uh, they didn't have any record books for these folks. Uh, Their motto is uh, we fought to fight because it took them a lot of fight to get into the, the to be allowed to fight with in the services. The Vietnam Memorial, this memorial here is unique, a little unique than, than the one that you see in DC. And you've got the 58,229 names etched in glass and they're alphabetical. While many come to reflect on the past, Shufflebein and others look ahead to the future. The Museum of the Marine is going to be a big asset to us. Uh, that's, that's in its beginning stages. The big motto around here is that you will never forget. You will be remembered for everything you've done and your sacrifices that you've, you've done for us to be, have our liberties and, and, and do everything we do today. Go with the flow. Coming up next on Veterans Voices, one Navy pilot's appreciation of that phrase. Plus, how one man in eastern North Carolina is making sure veterans are remembered each and every day. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. A Navy pilot who lives in Virginia takes us on a trip back in time where two superpowers flex their nuclear muscles as the world held its collective breath. As Tom Shad shows us, his close encounter with the enemy later led him to appreciate a new meaning to the phrase, go with the flow. Leonardo da Vinci called water the driving force of nature, but its stillness can also calm a restless soul maybe even save one. Hold that thought as we meet retired Rear Admiral Jake Tobin, or as he prefers, just Jake, and his recollection as a young Navy pilot in October 1962, the chilliest hours of the Cold War. Things were always interesting at that time. <laughs> Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. President Kennedy was very concerned about the missiles that were going in down there. We know it as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Jake Tobin was stationed on that island at Guantanamo Bay. There is the P-5 man. Okay, that's what you were flying. Yes. Tobin was co-piloting an unarmed seaplane for a surveillance mission over water. We were just part of the uh, surveillance to make sure we knew who was coming, who was going, and what was leaving. And we, we took off, 
and we were observing some area just on the western side of Cuba and we got a little too close to land. And that's when a Soviet fighter jet took notice. Here came this uh, Cuban MiG, come screaming at us, full bore, came right up next to us, turned around, came back in and had us targeted and I think fired. Their P-5M Marlin could not return fire. The only thing that we could do was head for the water. We get in that ground effect and we could fly forever. 15 feet, no problem. And that is how Jake Tobin fell in love with the water. Because during those heart-stopping moments, his seaplane could go where a MiG fighter could not. Thank you, God. <laughs> we were most grateful. Following tense negotiations, the Soviets agreed to pull their missiles from Cuba. Tobin retired as a rear admiral, but is still surrounded by water. It began to have more of a spiritual effect for me leaving time to reflect. And your career as a naval officer and a pilot? I know if I had to do it all over again, the good and the bad, I would. Including that day, 56 years ago, when we counted down to a nuclear war that did not happen, and a future rear admiral we know as... Just Jake. ...was saved by the water. Cheers. <laughs> One could say Jake Tobin's close call off the shores of Cuba is a microcosm of just how close the United States and Soviet Union came to a nuclear confrontation. Ahead on Veterans Voices, the fight on two fronts during World War II, the experience of one Tuskegee Airman coming up next. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. People across the nation will honor the men and women who have served our country on Veterans Day, November 11th. But one man here in the East makes it a point to do so year round. WNTT's Courtney Allen has that story from a cemetery in Wilson. A little bit of water and a whole lot of elbow grease. A soft bristle toothbrush to get into the letters. Turns a headstone like this into this. But it's not just any headstones Wilson resident Clarence Hollowell is fixing up. I'm cleaning headstones of veterans. I've been doing it for a year. Hollowell began his journey last summer as a mailman delivering mail to the Maplewood Cemetery. That's when he realized how bad the veterans headstones were. People just walk away and they can't read it. But once you clean it, people can actually identify it and look at how old they were and wonder what kind of person they were. Coming from a military family himself, the condition of the headstones hit close to home. My my dad was in the Coast Guard, did 20 years. I had another brother in the Coast Guard, two brothers in the Navy, and I did three years in the Army. The first one he cleaned was his father's. Now he's been gone 38 years now, and I just thought it was the, the right thing to do. You, you get emotional because it is your, your parent. Since then, Hollowell's cleaned over 500 graves between Maplewood and Rest Haven here in Wilson to the Bellhaven Community Cemetery and the Cedar Grove Cemetery in Elm City. Some take two to three weeks and others may take three to four months. He makes a point to learn about the person behind each headstone. Everybody has a story. I keep a journal. I, I write every man's name down. Everything that's on that stone, I'll document it. Then I'll go look on Ancestry.com and find out a story. To honor them the way they've honored our country. The military people are like the, the backbone of America. They gave up their tomorrows so I could have mine today. In Wilson, Courtney Allen, nine on your side. World War II was a difficult time for our nation, which was fighting evil abroad. But for African Americans serving in the military, their fight was on two fronts. This is the Montford Point Marine Memorial here in Jacksonville. It's a spot that remembers the 20,000 plus African American Marines who were trained not too far from here. It's a scene that played out in other branches of the military. Stephanie Harris sat down with a Tuskegee Airman who shared his experience. I still play golf. I'm still, still trying to get dates. <laughs> and at 92 years young, Dr. Harry Quinton is laughing his way through life. 
<laughs> By his smiles and jokes, you'd never know all the struggles he's been through. So life wasn't easy. If I could just get in and show what I could do, that I could survive. That attitude started at 16 when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Still in high school in Maryland, Quinton enlisted in the Army Reserves and trained as an aviation mechanic. He ended up at Daniel Field in Augusta, Georgia. There he saw firsthand how blacks in the military were treated differently. They had German POWs who were just laying around, drinking soda, smoking cigarettes having a good time. And I, I said, wow, they're treating German prisoners better than they are <clears throat> us. Quinton eventually ended up with the famous Tuskegee Airmen, the group of African-American pilots when he was sent to California. We knew what we were doing was something we hadn't been given an opportunity to, be, to do before. And we also knew that everybody thought we couldn't do it. Although he never went abroad to fight, he served his country following the war overseas and witnessing segregation at home. He says he always asked why blacks joined the war. Say we as a people had decided we weren't going to participate. It would have set us back another hundred years. After leaving the service, Quinton got married, went to school for accounting, but still found it hard to get a job. Soon they saw who I was, the whole attitude changed. Quinton ended up working for our businesses like Pan American Airlines and eventually spent 23 years as an IRS auditor for the Department of Treasury. They got an award from the Treasury Department for my years of service. That hangs on his wall with all the other awards and pictures, including those of his fellow airmen. This is when I met the president. Quinton now spends his time speaking about his experiences. I enjoy it and it's rewarding. I mean, I get all these accolades and attention, it feels good. And we feel good knowing he's sharing his story with others. I believe that if you prepare yourself and when the opportunity comes, you have to be ready. Quentin has won several local and national awards. He's even attended two presidential inaugurations. Coming up, the story of one Marine's fight on the battlefield and in life. You're watching Veterans Voices. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. We're introducing you to a man who knows how to fight, not just on the battlefield, but in his own personal life. He's seen the far corners of the world, from Mogadishu to Beirut. In fact, he survived the bombing that killed so many of his fellow Marines back in 1983. Those Marines are remembered here at the Beirut Memorial in Jacksonville. But now that Marine is leading the charge for his very survival. Tom Shad introduces us to him. It's morning in East Beach, a Norfolk neighborhood on the Chesapeake Bay adorned by star-spangled banners. And this one plays every morning from the naval base next door. It's a call for a retired Brigadier General. I have no regrets being a Marine. Chris Caldry walks the walk, or in this case, goes the distance. Because after more than 30 years in the Marines, Caldry is a battle-tested survivor. Willingly accept the risk. It's increased risk, and you know that there is a chance that you could not survive, and, and you accept it. That acceptance led Caldry to the darkest corners of the world. Martyr Square, they used to call it, I think. Where peace was measured in mere moments. The incoming that you took on the perimeter. Because death could come like a thief in the night. Oh, yeah, these guys. Uh, all of them were lost. Or... It could come in the morning, October 23rd, 1983. As a captain and rifle company commander, Caldry survived the single worst day for U.S. Marines since World War II. The earth shook, a tremendous explosion. Uh, I, I looked in the direction of our headquarters and there was a mushroom cloud. A suicide truck bomb had rammed the gates of the Marine barracks in Beirut, 
241 American service members died, okay. 220 of them Marines, including Captain Pete Shalaba. 35 years later, Caldry recalls these words to his wife. Jackie, Pete said, that's where he wants to be. And now Caldry is fighting another war. This one began in March 2015 when he caught his hand in the door. And I said, I don't know why I didn't miss, I missed the doorknob. Never missed the doorknob, in and out of that house a hundred times. After that incident, he went to Portsmouth Naval Medical Center and tests revealed a brain tumor. And I suspect it's glioblastoma. Surgery will go in the morning. And that's pretty much the way it was. Because you didn't have time. Didn't have time. He says there's not a whole lot of time. We've got to get in there and, and uh, do surgery. Glioblastoma, a rare form of brain cancer that took the life of another warrior, Senator John McCain. And of course my tumor was on the, on the left side. Cowdery shared the mask used to hold his head in place while the doctors shot beams of radiation to kill the cancer cells. So how do you feel about your chances? Well, I mean, you got to say, you know, uh, I'm hoping for the best. I just, I just said, God, I know why he's the one, because he's the only person I know that can deal with it. Doctors say the most common length of survival following a diagnosis of glioblastoma, 12 to 15 months. For Cowdery, it's been more than three and a half years. And to this Marine, it's a battle worth fighting, if only to show gratitude for all those times he escaped the call of death. I saw a lot of folks give their life and, and die a lot younger than my current age, I'm 68. And this Marine has proven that he's in this battle for the long run. And Condry and his family marked the day he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which was March 4th, 2015, as a command to march forth and fight against the disease. Up next on Veterans Voices, our final stop takes us to a historic home in Duplin County, which honors that county's rich military history. Welcome back to Veterans Voices. Our final stop takes us to the Duplin County town of Warsaw for a visit to the historic LP Best Home built in the late 1800s. The home was renovated in the 1990s and today not only does the history of that home live on, so too does the history of thousands of airy military veterans. We're well represented all the way through from the private all the way up. There's a rich military history in Warsaw. It's due in part to geography. We're the crossroads of the military with, the, with all the bases that are around us. Seymour Johnson Air Force Base sits just 25 miles to the north. Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune is 40 miles to the southeast. And 50 miles to the west is the U.S. Army's Fort Bragg, the largest military installation in the world. We'll get a lot of veterans, active veterans that come through. They'll see the sign outside the road and curiosity will bring them in. That curiosity brings them here to the LP Best House in Warsaw, built in 1894. Today, it's home to the Duplin County Veterans Memorial Museum. But we specifically honor Duplin County veterans. Earl Rouse is the curator of the museum and a Warsaw native. His time in the Coast Guard during Vietnam is displayed here. The criteria to get into the museum, you're born in Duplin County, you come back and lived in Duplin County, you died in Duplin County. I've always made a joke out of it. If you ride by the museum, I'll grab you and put you in honor roll. <laughs> that honor roll sits at the museum's entrance, filled with more than 8,000 names of Duplin County veterans. I think that we're still short several thousand. The museum is filled with the uniforms of local vets, medals, certificates, and pictures. Veterans from all eras are remembered here, from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War and beyond. For World War I and World War II, people begged to sign up to go. Korean, Vietnam, and Gulf War vets are honored too. This display highlights the 11 generals from Duplin County. We have more generals in Duplin County than any other county in North Carolina. And all of them lived in Duplin County at one time or another. Whether a general or a private, all of Duplin County's veterans are remembered here. 
But even if you don't have a connection to Warsaw, Earl believes you could still take away a lot by paying the museum a visit. The memories in here may not be known to someone that's outside of Duplin County, but they can relate to everything that's on this wall and what's on the floor because they had a loved one that went through it. It may not be military people, but it's the history that everybody needs to know. And Mr. Rouse does everything he can to make sure Duplin County veterans are remembered. You heard him mention he thinks there are several thousand vets not included in the honor roll at the museum. He now takes it upon himself to visit grave sites across the county to search for any veterans who haven't been recognized. Thank you so much for joining us on this Veterans Voices special, honoring those who serve. I'm Ken Watling. Have a great day.